കരുണാർണവമായി കരുതഗതി നൽകും അരുണാചല ശിവം നമസ്തെ വെൽക്കം ടു ദ നെക്സ്റ്റ് എപ്പിസോഡ് ഓഫ് ദൃഗ് ദൃശ്യ വിവേക ദിസ് എപ്പിസോഡ് ഫിനിഷ് ഇസ് ദ സെക്കൻഡ് സെക്ഷൻ of the book which talks about the meaning of tvam or thou in the vedic saying tat tvam masi meaning thou art that that means brahman But thou well let's let the verses speak for themselves <laughs> text 18 Similarly, Brahma, through the agency of the power that conceals the difference between it and the phenomenal universe, appears as if endowed with the attributes of change. Text 19. Atra pyavriti na shena vibhati brahma sarga yoho bhedas tayor vikarasyat sargena brahmani kvachit. In this case also, the distinction between brahman and the phenomenal universe becomes clear with the disappearance of the veiling power. Therefore, change is perceived in the phenomenal universe, but never in Brahman. So, text 18 begins with the word similarly. Uh, and that refers back to text 17. The character of an embodied self appears through false superimposition in the sakshin, the witness. With the disappearance of the veiling power, the distinction between the seer and the object becomes clear, and with it, the jiva character of the sakshin, the witness, disappears. Similarly, Brahman, through the agency of the power, well, we already read that. <laughs> so, by disappearing the veiling power, the covering power, of maya the actual nature of the witness and brahman become clear now what is the distinction between witness and brahman witness is the aspect of brahman which can view the creation the physical universe and brahman itself really has no interest in that so he is beyond the manifestation completely he just doesn't care so the point is in this section the nature of thou ha huh? tvam in tatvamasi is explained and really the nature of tvam depends on whether or not the veiling nature of maya is in force when it's in force the veiling nature obscures the real nature of the witness and makes it look like the jiva one who is born but the succeeding verses explain very nicely that what is born is completely illusory this is due to the projecting power of maya you see maya means that which is not so this whole projected universe the body the mind the ego the uh, senses and their objects are not real why are they not real because they're impermanent but because they're impermanent if we believe that they are real we suffer This is explained in great detail by the Buddha. 
So we went over that last time. But this time, I'd like to point out that in the next section, the nature of Brahman is explained very nicely. In other words, tat tvam asi. Huh? We've also already explained tvam in the previous few verses, seven verses, I think. And then the next few verses, the nature of tat or that will be explained. So the whole point here is that the so-called individual, the living entity, the jiva, one who is born, is non-existent. It's non-existent because it's temporary. It's temporary because maya is always changing. It's changing because it's an illusion. It's a, uh, a mirage, like the water in the desert. If you look at, at the mirage, if you've seen the water in the desert, you notice it's flickering. It's always changing. And when we look at the mind, we also see that it's flickering. The mind doesn't remain still without special training, even for a moment. In fact, the mind is so unstable and mercurial that the Buddha was unable to create a suitable simile for the mind, the changeability of the mind. He even admitted, he said, monks, I just can't come up with a good example. The mind is so changeable. There is no example that can explain it. So you have to look at your own mind. Anyone who sincerely and honestly sits down and observes their mind, <laughs> even for a few minutes, has to come to the conclusion that the mind is nuts. <laughs> the mind is insane. There is no such thing as logical thought. Huh? That's a pretense. That's a pose, a posture. It's an act. It's not really true. The mind doesn't work that way. The mind works by a tree-like structure of associations. And the roots and branches of that structure are in the gestation and birth period of each individual body. So because the mind is structured by traumatic events in early childhood, therefore everything we encounter reminds us in some way of this early suffering. And that's why, well, one of the reasons why experience in the, the manifested world is painful by nature. In the sutta we read yesterday, the Buddha points out that perceptions are painful and troublesome. Sensory experiences are painful and troublesome. Even consciousness itself is painful. Why? Because it introduces an artificial duality in the self. And then going all the way back to the beginning of this channel, in this series, Being in the World, is a link. We went through the existentialist analysis of the ontology of being. And what this really comes out to be is a struggle between the self and the world. That we want to live in a certain way. We want to be happy. We want to have this and that. Or we want to live in a certain way. But the world pushes back on us and says, no, you can't do that. You have to do things my way. So there's always this struggle between the individual and the world. Of course, both the individual and the world are maya. <laughs> so the whole thing is illusory. Huh? Just like right now, there are conflicts in many places in the world between the citizens and the government. And what can we say? Both of these things are illusory. Both sides are wrong. Both sides have a problem with identification and projection, uh, which is the basic mental derangement 
that is responsible for our suffering. It was just explained very nicely in the preceding texts. So it's really, I mean, it's sad. You know, it's funny in one way because everyone has the power to withdraw this identification. All you have to do is stop believing in name and form. You know, just like somebody takes this piece of land and names it America or Italy or Australia or something else, whatever. Uh, and then now it's a country. Uh, before it was just a piece of land. But now we come with our flag and we plant the flag and now it's our country. <laughs> It's just as ridiculous a farcical nonsense thing as creating a corporation. Huh? We have some people sign a bunch of papers and then all of a sudden there's this new entity with all the rights and more of a human being. Folks, this is nuts. We are creating these abstractions based on names and forms and then behaving like they're real. You know, let's run it up the flagpole and see if anybody salutes. Well, we're not saluting. We're trying to take off all abstractions and get down to the real experience, the reality of what is. And this is the mood of the sages, and it has always been like this. To try to take off all masks to try to see the reality. And we all struggle with the mind, don't we? We know the mind is problematic. And yet, most of us don't take any real action to stop this mind from exploiting us. We get exploited, why? Because we believe that the mind is real. We identify with the mind and think that this is me, this is myself, this is who I am, this mind, this body, these senses, this world. And because of that, we suffer. So all that's required to stop all this insanity is to stop believing in name and form, to stop believing that the word is the thing. Stop believing in abstractions that don't really exist. I can say the words, a, a jeweled castle in the sky. That doesn't make it real. The map is not the territory. The language is not the experience. Because it's abstract, it's unreal. The real experience is to remove this projection, to remove this identification, and see that None of it is real. None of it is real. Only the witness is real. Why? The witness never changes. The witness is there, unchangeable throughout waking, dreaming, sleeping, huh? throughout falling into the world and coming out of the world and getting moksha. Huh? Throughout all of the stuff, the rough and tumble of day-to-day -day life, the witness remains the same. The witness is the reality. Brahman is the reality. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mitya. This is the famous saying by Shankaracharya. Brahman is real, and the world is simply an illusion. So we have to deeply imbibe this truth. That means sitting. In practice, we have to sit several hours a day and simply contemplate on this fact. And every time we see the mind moving and trying to project or identify with some abstraction, we have to rein it back in and say, no, this is not who I am. This is not me. This is not myself. This is the practice that leads to liberation. Aum Tat Sat.
ओम शक्ति ओम